A few hundred yards away in the woods atop Hill 504, the commander of the 423rd Infantry, Colonel Cavender, was arriving independently of Colonel Deschenaux at the same decision, that it would be best to surrender. Calling his battalion commanders together, he surveyed the condition of their units. The 1st Battalion had virtually ceased to exist. Colonel Clink's 3rd Battalion had lost well over half its strength, including all of Company L, and Colonel Pewitt's 2nd Battalion had disappeared. There was no ammunition left, said Cavender, except for the few rounds each man still had on his person. Nobody had eaten all day. The supporting artillery had already been overrun. The officers detected what was coming. I know it's no use fighting, said one of them, but I still don't want to surrender. I was a GI in the First World War, said Cavender, and I want to see things from the soldier's standpoint. He was silent for a moment. Gentlemen, he said at last, we're surrendering at 4 p.m. One of those whom Cavender surrendered was the son of his division commander, Alan W. Jones, Jr. The 422nd and 423rd Infantry Regiments, along with their attached and supporting units, the 589th, 590th, and 592nd Field Artillery Battalions, Companies A and B, 81st Engineer Combat Battalion, Battery D, 634th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion, Company C, 820th Tank Destroyer Battalion, Companies A and B, 331st Medical Battalion, the 106th Reconnaissance Troop, and Troop B, 18th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron, lost more than 8,000 men in the fighting atop and in the shadow of the Schnee Eiffel. Many men got out before the surrender, including almost all the 592nd Field Artillery Battalion, part of the 589th, and some of Troop B, 18th Cavalry, along with a few men of the 106th Reconnaissance Troop, and still others had been wounded, captured or killed before the mass surrender. Some made it out individually or in small groups after the surrender, notably 40 men and two lieutenants, Harold A. McKinley of Company A, 423rd Infantry, and Ivan H. Long of the I and R Platoon, 422nd Infantry. Like most of those who escaped, men in that group hid in the woods by day and travelled by night, often guiding on the path of V-1 buzz bombs. How many men surrendered en masse in late afternoon of December 19th would never be known exactly. The 106th Division lost 6,879 men captured, to which would have to be added those captured from attached units for a total slightly above 7,000. Assuming an average strength of the infantry battalions at the time, Cavender and Deschenaux surrendered their regiments to be 500 men, possibly an overestimate, approximately 3,000 Americans surrendered in the two mass capitulations. Thus, the oft-suggested spectacle of some eight to 9,000 Americans plodding into Germany with hands overhead was false. There were men from both regiments who continued to fight even after the regimental commanders surrendered. For some, the fight was brief, for a cruel rumour spread that the 9th Armoured Division had recaptured Blealf, and many men, including those left in charge of the 422nd Infantry's vehicles, headed for Blealf. The rumour being baseless, the men paid dearly for their desperate gullibility. Meanwhile, fragments of the 422nd Infantry began to coalesce on high ground a few hundred yards outside the village of Laudersfeld, Hill 576, not far from the old firing positions of the 592nd Field Artillery Battalion. Their half-tracks of the 634th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion, originally in place to protect the artillery, had held their ground while the fighting surged around them. By midnight of December 19th, some 500 men had assembled on the hill, and under the overall command of the 2nd Battalion's executive officer, Major Albert A. Ouellette, they organised for defence. Almost every man had arrived with some ammunition, and on the anti-aircraft half-tracks and a few other vehicles were some 20.50 calibre machine guns. At least as important, there were enough rations for each man to have two meagre meals for two days. The men with the anti-aircraft half-tracks thought they still had radio communication with their battalion headquarters in St. Vith and reported that they were holding out. Even though they received no acknowledgement of the message, the fact that they had sent it provided hope that a relief column might eventually break through. The next day, December 20th, artillery fire began to pummel the position. 
German troops ringed it closely, as any attempt to move about the open hill in daylight quickly affirmed. But the Germans made no assault. The Americans, in time, obviously would have to surrender. Late that day, a German reconnaissance car flying a white flag and carrying a German medical officer approached. He wanted to arrange a truce, said the officer, to assure safe evacuation of both German and American wounded in the vicinity, but while he was about it, he suggested that the Americans surrender. At the invitation of the German, Major Ouellette sent with him a lieutenant, who returned a few hours later with word that the Germans had artillery pieces trained on Hill 576, and infantry poised to follow an artillery preparation to sweep the hill. The lieutenant knew it to be fact, for the Germans had paraded their preparations before his eyes. Although some of the junior officers still wanted to hold out, Major Ouellette saw no reason for further loss of life. On the promise of a ceasefire through the night, he agreed to surrender early the next morning. So closely ringed was the position that probably none of those who tried to sneak away during the night succeeded. At 8 a.m. on December 21st, the last organised resistance east of the Aar River ended. It marked the conclusion of the most costly defeat for American arms during the course of the war in Europe. Even as the men beyond the Aar River surrendered, General Jones and his staff were still trying to get them resupplied by air. It was a task that had proven utterly frustrating. Colonel Cavender had first asked for an airdrop early on December 17th and specified the most needed items. Somebody on Jones's staff contacted the air officer at headquarters of the 8th Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Josiah T. Town, and word went back to Cavender to expect a drop that night. It never came. Town relayed the request through the Nine Wex Fighter Command to the 9th Tactical Air Command, which in turn had to refer it to headquarters of the 1st Army for approval. Not until early the next morning, December 18th, did the request reach England and headquarters of the 9th Troop Carrier Command, whose C-47 transport planes would have to fly the mission. Ground crews loaded 40 planes of the 425th Troop Carrier Group with ammunition and medical supplies, but the weather was closing in and only 23 took off. Those planes arrived during the afternoon of the 18th over a base at Florennes in Belgium, where they were supposed to land, but the controller waved them off. The base was too busy to accommodate them. Most of the planes eventually landed at a base in France. The commander himself did land at Florennes, only to learn that nobody knew anything about the mission and that no fighter escort was available. During the early afternoon of December 19th, somebody at the 106th Division's headquarters asked headquarters of the 8th Corps if supplies had been dropped. It was late in the evening, and men of the 422nd and 423rd regiments were already trudging deep into Germany, before a reply came back, Supplies have not been dropped, will be dropped tomorrow weather permitting. It never took place. As senior commanders had accepted awkward defensive positions on the Schnee Eiffel, in the belief that nothing ever happened in the Ardennes, so they had failed to provide adequate machinery for responding to a sudden need for resupply by air. For except in pre-planned airborne operations, nobody ever got surrounded. Along the horseshoe-shaped defence protecting St. Vith, the Germans during December 19th made only reconnaissance probes. That was not what General von Manteuffel intended. He was counting on the arrival of the Führer Begleit Brigade and a strong thrust to take St. Vith on the 19th, but traffic conditions in the German rear were still appalling. Von Manteuffel himself went again to Schoenberg, where he found the traffic stacked up three abreast on the schoenberg andler Road. The 18th Volksgrenadier Division was still using two of its three regiments and all but one of its artillery battalions against the trapped Americans east of the hour and would be able to turn its full strength against St. Vith only after eliminating them. During the day, von Manteuffel met near Valerode with the commander of Army Group B, Field Marshal Model, and the commander of the 66th Corps, General Lucht, there was little the three officers could do other than vow to get the attack moving early on the 20th. By that time, the 62nd Volksgrenadier Division should have the bridge at Steinerbruck rebuilt, at least two of the 18th Volksgrenadier Division's regiments should be forward, and the Führer Begleit Brigade should be ready to make the principal thrust down the Amblev Highway into St. Vith. Then again, that depended upon untangling the traffic jams on the roads in the rear. 
During the afternoon of December 19th, the commander of the 9th Armoured Division's CCB, Bill Hogue, strode into a schoolhouse in the village of Krombach, two miles outside St. Veith, where Bruce Clark had moved his command post. Who do I work for? demanded Hogue. I was sent down here by First Army to be attached to Jones and the 106th Infantry Division. Where is Jones? Now I don't know what the situation is. Maybe I had better go back to Bastogne and find out. Clark tried to placate him. There was no need to deal with Jones. The two of them could work things out together. On a map, Clark noted that the positions occupied by Hoger's CCB the night before were for the most part forward of a railroad track built on a high embankment. He knew, said Clark, that the Germans were going to hit him hard and that sooner or later he was going to have to give up the town of St. Veith, which would eliminate the only route of withdrawal for those of Hoger's troops forward of the embankment. When Clark suggested that Hoge withdraw that night behind the embankment, Hoge agreed. It was on that same day, December 19th, that Colonel Nelson of the 28th Division's 112th Infantry reported to General Jones to announce the availability of his regiment and its supporting artillery battalion. Attaching the regiment to the 106th Division, Jones notified General Middleton, who subsequently approved. Jones told Nelson to tie his regiment's defences to the right flank of the 424th Infantry and block the main highway leading to Vilsalm from the south, a road that was, in effect, an extension of the Skyline Drive. By midnight of December 19th, a horseshoe-shaped defence of St. Veith had taken form. No reinforcements were to be expected. The next move was up to General Lucht and his 66th Corps. On the southern shoulder of the German offensive, amid the frontier villages, woods and steeply rolling hills between the southern reaches of the Skyline Drive and the Aar River, and below the confluence of the Aar and the Schur on either side of the Ernst Noir, Little Switzerland, the American troops at the start of the second day were having their difficulties, yet they were considerably better off than many of their colleagues elsewhere, primarily because they were facing no German armour, but only a parachute and three Volksgrenadier divisions of General Brandenburger's 7th Army. Those German divisions were in fact having problems throwing bridges across the Auer and the Schur in order to bring forward such fire support as they did possess, horse-drawn divisional artillery and the equivalent of an understrength battalion of self-propelled assault guns. There too, even though Brandenburger had assumed at the end of the first day that his adversary had committed all his local reserves, there were actually reserves still to make their presence felt. Although the 109th Infantry's Colonel Rudder had committed his reserve infantry battalion, primarily in an effort to rescue Company E, surrounded in Foran, he still had a company of medium tanks of the 707th Tank Battalion to add weight to a renewal of that effort. During the night, the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion, in the line to gain battlefield experience, had reverted to control of its parent command, the 9th Armoured Division's CCA, and the bulk of that combat command's tanks and self-propelled tank destroyers were still to enter the fight. On the high plateau east of the Ernst Noir, generally astride the highway linking Echternach and Luxembourg City, the 12th Infantry's Colonel Chance had committed the last of his reserve battalion. But the commander of the 4th Division, Tubby Barton, had arranged to borrow a company of medium tanks from the 9th Armoured Division's CCA. Taking a chance that the German offensive would not expand to the south, Barton was bringing forward the reserve battalion of his southernmost regiment, the 22nd Infantry. He also still had in reserve his organic reconnaissance troop and engineer combat battalion. More important still was another reserve whose early commitment Brandenburger could in no way have anticipated, that was the 10th Armoured Division's CCA, which at daybreak on December 17th began moving to Luxembourg from the sector of the 3rd Army in northeastern France. The combat command was to be available at the start of the third day, December 18th. American commanders intended on the second day, December 17th, to use their local reserves to rescue surrounded units, strengthen threatened units, and block exits from the gorge of the Ernst Noir leading into the rear of the units on either side. Rudder of the 109th Infantry was to rescue Company E in Foran. Collins of the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion was to block roads leading into his rear from the Ernst Noir and maintain contact with his line companies on the wooded heights overlooking the Shore River.
and chance of the 12th Infantry was to rescue the men of Company F in the Park Hotel outside Berdorf and the men of Company E in Echternach, and to reinforce the hard-pressed men of the 3rd Battalion southeast of Echternach in Osweiler and Dickweiler. In the northern part of the 109th Infantry's sector, where the commander of the 85th Corps, General Knees, was trying to break the 5th Parachute Division loose in order to lean on the advance of the adjacent Panzer Lehr Division, the Germans were content to bypass most isolated defensive positions in favour of pushing on to the Skyline Drive. Yet if they were to open a road for their drive to the west, they had to have Hoscheid on the Skyline Drive. That was what had led to the day-long fight for the village, ending after nightfall with American withdrawal. A road westward at last available, the 5th Parachute Division from that point became, in effect, an adjunct of the 5th Panzer Army's drive for Bastogne. The situation of the 5th Parachute Division at Hoscheid was similar to that of the 352nd Volksgrenadier Division at Foren. The Volksgrenadiers needed the village in order to gain access to the valley of the Schur River at Diekirch and their assigned road leading west. But without support from assault guns, it was difficult to force the 109th Infantry's Company E from Foren. Because of American artillery fire, it was late in the night of December 17th before a bridge was in place to allow assault guns to cross the hour. Yet even though two American companies trying to gain Foren had help from a platoon of medium tanks, the Volksgrenadiers managed to prevent them from breaking through to the village. When Company E radioed in some desperation for food and ammunition, Colonel Rudder ordered a patrol to try to get through after nightfall, but again Foran remained out of reach. The last word from Company E came by radio an hour after midnight, when a patrol from the I&R platoon, accompanied by a tank, got within 200 yards of the village at daylight, the men could see that the house that had served as the company command post had burned to the ground. Company E, 109th Infantry, had ceased to exist. The collapse at Furen meant increased pressure on the 109th Infantry's 3rd Battalion close by in the angle formed by confluence of the hour and the shore, for it left that battalion's northern flank exposed. Eliminating that battalion was critical to the German advance, for it was forward observers with the battalion who were directing the shelling of the 352nd Volksgrenadier Division's bridge site. At dawn on December 18th, a German regiment hit the 3rd Battalion's north flank and surrounded and captured a platoon of Company K, but the battalion held. Despite that stand, the positions of the 109th Infantry were fast becoming untenable, for there was no way to halt German movement between the widely spaced American positions. By midday of December 18th, German forces the size of companies and even battalions were moving almost with impunity behind the American-held villages. Here and there they overwhelmed little outposts trying to fill the gaps between villages. A brace of 57mm anti-tank guns, a few men from Cannon Company fighting as infantry, a squad of engineers defending a roadblock. As early as the pre-dawn hours of December 17th, a battery of 105mm howitzers of the 107th Field Artillery Battalion just behind the southern reaches of the Skyline Drive came under small arms fire from German patrols, and in the early afternoon on the 18th, an entire battalion of Volksgrenadiers attacked that battery, and a nearby battery of 155mm howitzers of the 108th Field Artillery Battalion. While neighbouring batteries took the Germans under fire, two half-tracks from the 447th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion raced up the Skyline Drive, their quad 50s blazing, and chased the Germans off the road. From the north, the platoon of tanks sent to try to break through to Hoshide returned and helped drive the Germans away. The artillery pieces were for the moment safe, but it was obvious that all the artillery in support of the 109th Infantry would have to displace. By that time, Companies F and G had fallen back on the 2nd Battalion's headquarters village of Bastendorf, and remnants of Companies A and B, having failed to reach Foren, fell back under fire to a road junction less than half a mile from the road following the trace of the Schur River into Diekirch. If the men of the 3rd Battalion were to withdraw from their positions in the angle formed by confluence of the Hour and Schur, they would need that road. Early that same afternoon, December 18th, two assault guns supporting a battalion of Volksgrenadiers hit the road junction. With the first rounds, 
the German guns knocked out six 57mm anti-tank guns and one of three medium tanks still fighting with Company A. For a moment it looked like a breakthrough, but with the help of the two surviving tanks, the infantry rallied and held. To Colonel Rudder, the near disaster at the road junction underscored the need to pull his regiment back and consolidate along a new line. Although he had in mind eventual withdrawal behind the Shore River, he asked authority at first merely to consolidate on high ground near Dekirk. The men were well dug in on the high ground by the next afternoon, the 19th, when German artillery, having at last crossed the hour, opened heavy preparation fire. Yet the attack by Volksgrenadiers was weak. In more than three days of fighting, the 352nd Volksgrenadier Division had lost heavily, and in the attack that afternoon, the division commander, Colonel Erich Schmidt, was seriously wounded. That night, Colonel Rudder asked General Cota for permission to withdraw behind the shore. Cota suggested instead that Rudder fall back along the ettelbrook bastogne Highway, thereby rejoining the 28th Division. But because of the 5th Parachute Division's advance, Rudder believed that would be less a withdrawal than an attack. Use your own judgment, said Cota finally. You are on the ground. Under protective artillery fires, most of the troops left Dekirk before midnight along the road to Ettelbrook, and before daylight the following morning were digging in on high ground south and west of Ettelbrook. From those positions they could cover both the ettelbrook bastogne Highway and the principal highway leading south from Ettelbrook to Luxembourg City. An attached company of the 28th Division's Organic Engineers blew bridges both at Dekirk and at Ettelbrook. In Dekirk, at the first rumour that the Americans were going to abandon the town, the civilians erupted from their cellars into the streets. They had started to flee early on December 16th, but in order to keep the roads open for military movement, local officials at the behest of officers of the 109th Infantry had halted the exodus. Over the next few days, the local gendarmerie had helped the Americans by housing German prisoners of war in the town jail. Fearing reprisals, the civilians were determined to leave, and with Colonel Rudder's approval, they followed the Americans out of town. More than 3,000 men, women and children set out in freezing cold and darkness along the roads leading south. For the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion between the Shore River and the gorge of the Ernes Noir, the basic concern was likely German movement up the undefended gorge and egress along one of the three roads leading into the rear of the American positions. There was also the possibility of envelopment from the north, where on the first day the Germans had eliminated a small outpost which the armoured infantry battalion commander, Colonel Collins, had positioned there to give the alarm. During the night of December 16th, the commander of the battalion's parent unit, Colonel Thomas L. Harold of the 9th Armoured Division's CCA, took a few steps toward blocking those possibilities. He sent the 19th Tank Battalion's company of light tanks to screen the northern flank. He attached a troop of the 89th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron to Collins to patrol the road from the Ernes Noir into Collins's headquarters town of Beaufort, and he sent another troop plus the 76mm self-propelled guns of Company B, 811th Tank Destroyer Battalion, to block the other two roads leading up from the gorge. Those were timely steps but they were insufficient to prevent German infiltration. During the night of the 16th, troops of the 276th Volksgrenadier Division worked southward through some woods in the rear of Collins's companies, and others occupied a ridge line between Beaufort and the forward companies. Although a counterattack by the attached cavalry cleared the ridge line, the Germans in the woods remained, which meant that the line companies of the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion were cut off. At the same time, a regiment of Volksgrenadiers moved unopposed up the gorge of the Ernes Noir to the settlement of Mullathal, where the road along the bottom of the gorge met another bisecting the gorge, an intersection that soon became known to American troops as the T. From Mullathal, the Germans threatened the village of Waldbillig, not far behind firing positions of the 3rd Armoured Field Artillery Battalion. Early that afternoon, a troop of cavalry reinforced by four self-propelled tank destroyers tried to drive the Volksgrenadiers from Mullathal, but on a narrow, winding road leading down into the gorge, a German with a Panzerfaust knocked out the leading tank destroyer, blocking the road. Dismounted cavalry got nowhere, 
and as daylight waned, the American force withdrew to the top of the gorge. As night came on the 17th, Folk's grenadiers at the other end of the gorge poured into Beaufort. Colonel Collins ordered his headquarters troops to withdraw, while the attached troop of cavalry under Captain Victor C. Liker fought a rear guard action. Liker's troop managed to hold for about two hours, just long enough for self-propelled pieces of the 3rd Armoured Field Artillery Battalion near the next village to displace. During the night, the only radio still affording communication with the trapped companies of the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion, one belonging to an artillery forward observer, ceased to function. Yet that was of little concern for the moment in view of the fact that the commander of CCA, Colonel Harold, was assembling a force to attack early the next morning to relieve the armoured infantrymen and drive the enemy into the river. And it was an impressive force. Two companies of mediums of the 19th Tank Battalion, a company of the 9th Armoured Engineer Battalion mounted in half-tracks to fight as infantry, a troop of the 89th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron and the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion's Y and R Platoon. The attack was to begin from what was fast becoming CCA's new defensive line, extending from Waldbillig northward along a ridge line through the village of Savilborn and on to screening positions of the light tanks in Ermsdorf. On the German side, the commander of the 276th Volksgrenadier Division, General Lieutenant Kurt Mooring, was at the same time preparing to attack the centre of that line at Savilborn, from which Harold's attack was to debouch. Mooring had a battalion of Volksgrenadiers and an anti-tank company with 54 Panzerfausts. Unknown to General Mooring, his failure to build a bridge quickly across the shore, which had resulted in a slow build-up beyond the river, had prompted his superior, General Brandenburger, to call upon Field Marshal Model at Army Group B to send a replacement for Mohring. As it turned out, Mohring was riding in his command car that evening near Beaufort when fire from an American machine gun killed him. The next morning, the steps Mohring had taken to assemble a force near Savilborn served the 276th Volksgrenadier Division well. Before daylight, as the Germans were preparing to attack Savilborn, the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion's Y and R Platoon, in the vanguard of the attacking American force, entered the woods outside the village. German fire killed the platoon leader at the outset, and in the end virtually wiped out the platoon. After daylight, the main body of CCA's attacking force followed along the same road through the woods, and to men in the half-tracks and tanks there appeared to be a Panzerfaust behind every tree. In what seemed to be only minutes, the Panzerfausts knocked out a light tank and six Shermans. The commander of the leading medium tank company, Captain Arthur J. Banford, Jr., his own tank shot from under him, ordered withdrawal. Pleading insufficient foot troops to protect the tanks, the entire column fell back on Savilborn, an inauspicious first offensive action for those troops of CCA, and it left the men of the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion to fend for themselves. In the beleaguered positions of that battalion, the artillery forward observer late in the afternoon of December 18th finally managed to repair his radio. By order of Colonel Harold, the men were to make their way out by infiltration. That night, and over the next two nights, 400 men made their way to safety, but in the three-day fight, the 60th Armoured Infantry Battalion lost close to 350 men, most of them during the withdrawal. The new line to be held by the 9th Armoured Division's CCA extended for more than seven miles, from Waldbillig alongside the Ernst Noir, through Savilborn and Ermsdorf and beyond. Yet despite the length of that line, a gap between the combat command and the 109th Infantry of four miles still existed. That regiment's depleted 2nd Battalion soon moved into the gap, a stopgap measure at best, but as it turned out, all that was needed. A new commander for the 276th Volksgrenadier Division, Colonel Hugo Dempwolf, made it his first priority to reorganise his command, for casualties had been heavy. Still lacking a bridge over the shore, he arranged during the night of December 18th to pass his artillery and supplies over bridges belonging to the two adjacent divisions. And when his engineers at last completed a bridge late on the 19th, he was able to move forward three assault guns that the commander of the 7th Army, General Brandenburger, had scrounged from some place. 
Only with the arrival of those guns was Colonel Dempwolf prepared for the 276th Volksgrenadier Division to return to the offensive, and by that time higher command had arrived at other plans. By daylight on December 17th, the slight superiority in numbers possessed by the commander of the 212th Volksgrenadier Division, General Major Franz Sensfuss, over the 12th Infantry's Colonel Chance, five infantry battalions, one regiment served as the 7th Army's reserve, against three, had disappeared. For the commander of the 4th Division, General Barton, had ordered the reserve battalion of his southernmost regiment to the threatened sector and his organic engineer battalion into the line as infantry. That made it five against five, and Barton had a decided edge in artillery, tanks and tank destroyers, for Sensfus had only four assault guns, and as yet no way to get them or his horse-drawn artillery across the Shore River. Although Sensfus's engineers had thrown a bridge across the shore on the first day of the offensive, American artillery fire knocked it out before the first vehicle could cross. That night the German engineers brought down searchlights close to the river opposite Echternach. They planned to build a bridge based on the stone piers of an earlier bridge that had served the town since the Middle Ages. But American shelling again interfered. Falling back, the engineers had to wait for daylight before building a bridge at another site downstream, and not until late afternoon of December 18th did that bridge begin to serve the division. The first move General Barton made early on December 17th to meet the continuing German threat was to send the 4th Reconnaissance Troop and the 4th Engineer Combat Battalion before daylight to an obvious point of danger. The high ground above the gorge of the Ernst Noir, not far from Mullathol, and the road intersection known as the T. When in the early morning Volksgrenadiers reached Mullathol, Barton decided to reinforce by creating Task Force Luckett, headed by a former commander of the 12th Infantry, Colonel James S. Luckett, then carried as an excess officer with the division headquarters. In addition to the reconnaissance troop and the engineers, Luckett was to have eight Shermans which Company B, 70th Tank Battalion, had by that time managed to put into some kind of operating order, the tank battalion's mortar platoon, and the reserve battalion of the adjacent 8th Infantry. Calling on that battalion was a risk, for the German offensive still might expand southward, but knowledge that the 10th Armoured Division's CCA was on the way made Barton's decision easier. When the eight Shermans arrived in mid-afternoon of the 17th, Colonel Luckett sent them to block the gorge of the Urns Noir a half-mile upstream from Mullathal, and when the 8th Infantry's reserve battalion reached the scene, the second under Lieutenant Colonel George L. Mabry, he added the infantry to that block. Yet ironically, General Barton had created a block against a German force that threatened not his 12th Infantry, but rather the 9th Armoured Division's CCA. For the Germans in the gorge were from the 276th Volksgrenadier Division, whose zone of advance lay on CCA's side of the gorge. Barton and Luckett would be left to wonder why the Germans made no effort to emerge from the gorge into the rear of the 12th Infantry. Elsewhere, the 12th Infantry spent the second day of the German offensive trying to rescue surrounded units and reinforce others. The regimental commander, Colonel Chance, again sent Company B, reinforced by a platoon of light tanks and four mediums, to clear the village of Berdorf and rescue the men of Lieutenant Leake's Company F. That was no easy assignment, for Berdorf was an elongated village extending for more than half a mile along a spine formed by the highway leading from the 2nd Battalion's headquarters village of Konsdorf. Accompanied by the light tanks, half of the infantrymen worked house by house up the spine, while the rest of the men and the four medium tanks bypassed the village over open ground between the village and the Urns Noir. That route led to Lieutenant Leake's little force in the Park Hotel. As the four tanks neared the hotel, it looked to Lieutenant Leake as if they were manoeuvring to get into position to fire on it. As indeed they were, for since Lieutenant McConnell had lost Company F's SCR 300 during his fracas with the Germans in Berdorf, Leake had had no way to report his position, how to reveal to the tanks that Americans held the hotel. Leake had no identification panels, no flares, nothing. One man suddenly remembered that in rummaging through the drawers of a dresser in one of the rooms, he had come across an American flag. He rushed to find it, and a volunteer climbed to the shattered roof of the hotel and waved it frantically. 
As the tanks and their accompanying infantry reached the hotel, the rest of Company B was pushing the Germans past the road junction a hundred yards away in Berdorf, but that was as far as the attack carried before nightfall brought a halt. Leek and his men continued to hold the hotel, for that provided good flank protection for the men in Berdorf. In the centre of the 12th Infantry's sector on December 17th, Colonel Chance sent Company A to reinforce Company G in Lauterborn, astride the last high ground before the highway dropped down into Echternach, whereupon the two companies were to drive to the relief of Company E inside Echternach. Because the Germans held high ground on either side of the highway leading into Lauterborn, it took Company A the better part of the day to get into the village, and by that time it was too late to continue the attack. The men of Company E remained isolated in Echternach. On the right of the 12th Infantry's sector, in Osweiler and Dickweiler, the 3rd Line Company of Chance's Reserve 1st Battalion, Company C, reinforced the defending companies of the 3rd Battalion, and in mid-morning, the Reserve Battalion from the 22nd Infantry, the 2nd under Lieutenant Colonel Thomas A. Keenan, detrucked behind the two villages. The men of one company climbed immediately onto the decks of a company of tanks, borrowed from the 9th Armoured Division's CCA, and headed for Osweiler. On the way they flushed and routed a company of Germans in some woods alongside the road, and in the process freed 16 men of Company C, captured during the company's move to Osweiler. In mid-afternoon the rest of Colonel Kennan's battalion headed for Osweiler on foot. The column was nearing the crest of a ridge a mile short of the village when a column of Germans appeared. Taken by surprise, the men of both columns dropped to the ground and opened fire. The fight was a standoff until darkness came, when the Germans disengaged, and the next morning Kanan's men resumed their march to Osweiler. Aye. The Germans had been on their way to Scheidgen, close by Konsdorf and headquarters of the 12th Infantry's 2nd Battalion. There the Germans gained their only success of the day when a platoon of self-propelled tank destroyers abandoned the village without a fight. With only a few men from the headquarters available to defend Konstorf, the battalion commander, Major John W. Dorn, spent an anxious night, but the Germans made no effort to push beyond Scheidgen. At the end of the second day of the German offensive, the trace of a new defensive line was beginning to take shape in the 12th Infantry's sector. Osweiler and Dickweiler on the right were firmly held, a fact soon recognised by the German commander General Sensfuss who made no further attempt to take those villages. So too, on the left, Task Force Luckett had firmly anchored the line along the upper reaches of the Ernst Noir. The weakness was in the centre, where there was a gap between Osweiler and Konsdorf along the principal highway through the sector, the road from Luxembourg City to Echternach, which General Sensfuss also recognised and intended to try with his limited means to exploit. Out in front were two projections, Company B and Lieutenant Leake's little band at Berdorf constituted one. Companies A and G in Lauterborn and Company E in Echternach constituted the other. Except for the danger to the men in those projections, the 12th Infantry at nightfall on December 17th was in fairly good shape, and reinforcements were arriving. They consisted of a Corps Engineer Battalion, the 159th, which General Barton put in reserve near his left flank, lest the enemy break through the adjacent sector, and the 10th Armoured Division's CCA. After conferring with General Middleton in Bastogne, the commander of the 10th Armoured Division, General Morris, met with Barton in Luxembourg City and agreed on how to use CCA. Since the entire 10th Armoured Division, except for CCB at Bastogne, was to be committed in Luxembourg, CCA was not attached to the 4th Division. The two commanders nevertheless agreed that the armour would attack the next day, the 18th, through the positions of the 12th Infantry, to drive the Germans back across the shore. In early afternoon, Barton worked out the details of that commitment with CCA's commander, Brigadier General Edwin W. Pyburn. One task force was to clear the gorge of the Ernst Noir, a second to push through Berdorf and thence into Echternach, and a third to retake Scheidgen, link with the infantry in Lauterborn, and continue into Echternach. Since Barton was most concerned about the possibility of the Germans debouching in strength from the Ernst Noir, the first of Pyburn's task forces to arrive was to be committed there. It was unfortunate that the first task force contained the bulk of the combat command's medium tanks, 
for the gorge of the Urns Noir was no place for tanks. As the three task forces began to advance early on December 18th, the Germans made their move to exploit the gap between Osweiler and Scheidgen. Two German battalions drove south along secondary roads close by the main highway leading to Luxembourg City, in effect cutting into the rear of the American troops at Osweiler and Dickweiler, and, if the advance continued, into the rear of the neighbouring 8th Infantry. Fortunate it was for the Americans that those two German battalions had lost heavily in the first two days of fighting, for in the sector where they struck, the 12th Infantry had no prepared defensive positions. In both cases, the Germans bumped into forces that had to turn from other duties to fight back. In one hamlet, the 12th Infantry's cannon company caught as the cannoneers were moving into new firing positions. In another, the rear command post of the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Infantry, whose headquarters troops had the support of only a platoon of towed tank destroyers. Yet in both cases, the Americans held off the Germans long enough for a few medium tanks to get forward and enable them to withdraw. The German commander, General Sensfuss, may not have realised it, but he had at last achieved a breakthrough, for in the hamlets ahead hardly anybody stood in the way. Yet both German battalions, already under strength, had taken heavy losses during the day and were in no condition to exploit their gains. Once General Sensfuss had learned of the arrival of American armour, he convinced General Brandenburger to release his 3rd Regiment from the 7th Army's reserve but it would be another 24 hours, at best, before that regiment got across the Shaw River. Meanwhile, the attacks by the three task forces of the 10th Armoured Division's CCA achieved little, particularly the attack aimed at clearing the enemy from the gorge of the Urns Noir. Tanks of the 11th Tank Battalion entered the gorge upstream from German-held Mullethal, but because the road at the bottom of the gorge was narrow and closely confined on both sides by woods, the width of the attacking front was the width of one medium tank. When a round from an anti-tank gun damaged the leading tank, it took considerable time to work the rest of the column around. It was late afternoon before the head of the task force reached Mollethal, there to confront a strong German position. CCA's second task force, composed of the 61st Armoured Infantry Battalion and a company of Shermans, moved to Berdorf and there joined the 12th Infantry's Company B in clearing the rest of the village. Progress was slow. When night came, the Germans still held a few houses in Berdorf, and the task force had made no progress on its second assignment of pushing beyond Berdorf into Echternach. The third and smallest task force, composed of a company each of medium tanks and armoured infantry, found only an enemy rear guard in Scheidgen, and with the help of two companies of the 159th Engineer Combat Battalion, soon took a commanding height overlooking Lauterborn. Once inside the village, the two companies of the 12th Infantry delayed their planned push into Echternach to await arrival of the tanks. Yet when the tanks got there, the task force commander, Lieutenant Colonel John R. Riley, considered it too late in the day to continue into Echternach. While the task force holed up for the night at the mill alongside the road to Echternach, where Company G had its command post, Riley sent two tanks accompanied by two squads of infantry into Echternach to ascertain how the 12th Infantry's Company E was faring. Fairly well, as it turned out. The company commander, 1st Lieutenant Morton A. McDiarmid, had established his headquarters near the edge of town in a hat factory along the road to Lauterborn, the Rue de Luxembourg, and his kitchen in the garage of the adjacent Hotel de Luxembourg. The headquarters was under no particular enemy pressure, and MacDiarmid had withdrawn such men of the rifle platoons as could make it back to the command post, but others in outposts elsewhere in the town, including an entire platoon, were cut off. What MacDiarmid wanted was not relief from the assignment of defending Echternach, but tanks to help extricate the men who were cut off. Although the commanders of the two tanks were unwilling to risk the peril of Panzerfausts in narrow streets after nightfall, they promised to return along with additional tanks the next morning, 